Tonight we're in chapter 24. I had at one point considered going into chapter 25 also and taking both chapters, but I got hung up here in chapter 24. And so we're going to just stay in uh, Ezekiel chapter 24 today. Let's read the first two verses and we'll look at Ezekiel chapter 24. Ezekiel 24, verse 1, again, in the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, write down the name of the day, this very day. The king of Babylon started his siege against Jerusalem, this very day. So this prophecy that we begin here in chapter 24 actually is given two years after the prophecies that we've already looked at in chapters 20 through 23. Those chapters were recorded during the seventh year of Jehoiachin's captivity, and that would have been 590 B.C. So here, as we look at this, Ezekiel in verse 1 actually gives a precise date. The date would be translated uh, January 15th, 588. And so that would mark the fall of the city of Jerusalem, which is being spoken of. On that day... The Babylonians began an 18-month siege of the city of Jerusalem. And so that's what he's saying when he says, In the ninth year, the tenth month, tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, write down the name of the day this very day. The king of Babylon started his siege against Jerusalem this very day. So he gives us a precise date. It's two years after he had concluded in the prophecies in chapters 20 through 23. And now we get an opportunity to see some of the things that he has had uh, been given to him by the Lord concerning that. Verse 3, utter a parable to the rebellious house. Say to them, thus says the Lord God, put on a pot, set it on, and also pour water into it. Gather pieces of meat in it, every good piece, the thigh and the shoulder. Fill it with choice cuts. Take the choice of the flock Also pile fuel bones under it, make it boil well, and let the cuts simmer in it. So what he's picturing here is actually God's sheep, God's flock, being boiled in a pot. And so what we're looking at, this parable of the boiling pot, is really God's judgment uh, on the city of Jerusalem. That's what this is a picture of. Uh, According to Jeremiah, if you take notes, it's found in Jeremiah 39, verse 1. Jeremiah writes, In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army against Jerusalem, and they besieged it. And so that's what he's speaking about here concerning this siege and these good pieces of flesh, as he, as he says there in verse 4, gather pieces of meat in it, every good piece. The good pieces of flesh that he's speaking about would be the leadership because the city is about to be besieged, it's engulfed in war, and he's bringing judgment. Continuing, he he says in verse 6, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city, to the pot whose scum is in it. That word scum is better translated rust, and whose scum is not gone from it. Bring it out piece by piece on which no lot has fallen. For her blood is in her midst. She set it on top of a rock. She did not pour it on the ground to cover it with dust that I may raise up fury and take vengeance. I have set her blood on top of a rock, that it may not be covered. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Woe to the bloody city! I too will make the pyre great. Heap on the wood, kindle the fire, cook the meat well, mix in the spices, and let the cuts be burned up. Then set the pot empty on the coals, that it may become hot, and its bronze may burn, that its filthiness may be melted in it, that its scum may be consumed." She has grown weary with lies, and her great scum is not gone from her. Let her scum be in the fire. Let your filthiness, in your filthiness is lewdness, because I have cleansed you. You were not cleansed. You will not be cleansed of your filthiness anymore till I have caused my fury to rest upon you. I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass. I will do it. I will not hold back, nor will I spare, nor will I relent according to your ways, According to your deeds, they will judge you, says the Lord God. Another very cheery passage from Ezekiel. Scum. Rust. That's a symbol. 
when he speaks concerning this, and notice how he keeps repeating that, it's a, it's a symbol of corrosion. It's a symbol of the corrosion of the city. Instead of the city being called the holy city, notice how it's being referred to now. Jerusalem is referred to now as the bloody city. Now, the mention of blood, when he speaks of the city in that way in verse 6, woe to the bloody city, the mention of blood may be a statement about the deaths that have been being suffered there in that city. Remember, they actually were killing their own babies and offering them up to a pagan god, a devil by the name of Molech. We saw that in chapter 23, remember at verse 37, it says they've committed adultery and blood is on their hands. They have committed adultery with their idols and even sacrificed their sons whom they bore to me, passing them through the fire to devour them. They were guilty of idolatry of the worst sort. They were sacrificing their own babies. And so he speaks concerning the fact that this is a city of blood. Bloody city would also speak of their open sins, and they had so, so many of them. Notice verse 7, how he speaks about setting it on top of a rock. Setting it on top of a rock reveals how open Israel's sins were. Anybody could see them is the point that he's making. You see, sometimes people may think that they're getting away with something, but God would say, you're not. There's nothing you can get away with. God said that their sin is going to be openly revealed and that all people will see them for what they are. Sometimes people think that if they dress up their lives, they can hide their sins. And some people do a very good job of it. There are some people who are very guilty of, of deep sin, but when you see them, they have an appearance of, of goodness. They, they can seem to be the nicest guy, nicest woman on the job, nicest person in the neighborhood. They're able to mask their sins. They hide them. There are other people that you see, and you know that person's a sinner. I mean, they come stumbling up to you drunk or loaded, or you watch them doing something pretty bad. They're pretty openly a sinner. It's the ones who sometimes have that, that righteous appearance that, that seem to be getting away with things. It's interesting how in the New Testament book of 1 Timothy in chapter 5, verse 24, how, how Paul wrote, uh, some men's sins are clearly evident, preceding them to judgment, but those of some men follow later. Some people's sins are open, and you can see them openly, but others, well, they're things that are only revealed later on. God is saying that this particular city, the city of Jerusalem, this bloody city, the, her sins are going to be open for all to see. People will see that sin. Verse 7 again, her blood is in her midst. She set it on top of a rock. But he goes on to say, she did not pour it on the ground to cover it with dust. Now, blood, this is interesting, blood that was shed was to be covered with dust, which was symbolic of burial. According to Leviticus chapter 17, verses 13 and 14, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And therefore, blood was required to be covered. And so, if there was blood that was poured out, it was to be covered by dirt. And so, what she's doing is violating the law of God here. In verse 8, he says, that it may raise up fury and take vengeance. I have set her blood on top of a rock that it may not be covered. And so, it's interesting when you see blood that is not covered, it actually calls for God's vindication of the blood that has been spilled. Again, if you take notes, you might know Genesis chapter 4 verse 10, because when Cain rose up and slew his bro brother Abel, uh, God said in Genesis 4, verse 10, the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And so, blood that isn't covered calls for God to vindicate. And so, what he's saying here is God is going to allow Jerusalem's blood to be spilled and it's going to remain unburied. Now, in verses 9 through 12, when he says, woe to the bloody city, I too will make a great pyre, make the, the pyre great, Heap on the wood, kindle the fire, cook the meat well, mix in the spices, let the cuts be burned up. God is making it very clear that this reason that is, this is going to take place is you have provoked me. You have provoked me to response, and I'm going to be furious in my judgment against you. And the people are going to be consumed according to verses 11 and 12. And the pot will be heated even though it's empty. And the point that he's making there is when I bring my judgment on you, when Babylon comes in and does what Babylon will do, 
My judgment is going to be complete. It's interesting when you uh, read 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 9 and 10, which records what took place. God's judgment was complete. It, it reads, Nebuzaradan burned the house of the Lord and the king's house. All the houses of Jerusalem, that is, all the houses of the great, he burned with fire. And all the army of the Chaldeans, who were with the captain of the guard, broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around. And so when God brought judgment, he brought complete and severe judgment, which is what Ezekiel is saying. Now, in verses 13 and 14, when he says, In your filthiness is lewdness, because I have cleansed you and you were not cleansed, you will not be cleansed of your filthiness anymore till I have caused my fury to rest upon you. I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass, and I will do it. I will not hold back, nor will I spare, nor will I relent. According to your ways and according to your deeds, they will judge you, says the Lord God. In the past, God had chastised them, but they didn't learn. They continued unrepentant. In the past, prophets had come to the nation of Israel and had warned them. Judgments from God had fallen on them. Punishments had been experienced. None of that worked. So God is saying, you've rejected chastisement. And because you reject it, I will not spare, I will not relent, I will not hold back. Now, it's interesting in verse 14 how he says, according to your ways and according to your deeds, they will judge you. In other words, you're going to reap what you have sown and your judgment will be fair. Isaiah, in chapter 3, verse 11, said, Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. You're going to reap what you have sown, if you sow to the flesh, Paul said to the Galatians, from the flesh you shall reap corruption. But he also said, if you sow to the Spirit, from the Spirit you shall uh, reap life. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that also shall he reap. And so when we sow to the flesh, from the flesh we reap corruption. God is simply saying, you have been sowing sins and you are going to reap, and, and the fact is, according to your deeds, they will judge you. The things that you've done are going to be what is used as a standard of judgment. In the New Testament, in Romans chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, Paul said, in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you're treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Sometimes we think that God judges on the curve. So we have a lot of friends that we hang around with who are worse than us, kind of hoping for a group judgment. You can kind of point to them and say, I'm better than that, right? I think that everybody of us has a friend in our back pocket who's worse than us that we can point to. But the bottom line is we need to remember God has made it very clear. The standard of righteousness and entrance into the kingdom of God isn't that we tried isn't that we're better than the average sinner. The standard for entrance into the kingdom of God, as is revealed to us in both Old and New Testament, is really perfection. That's the standard. Now, obviously, nobody's perfect. And so what we needed was somebody who could meet that standard. The Christian message is simple in that it points out that man cannot meet God's righteous standard, therefore God met the standard himself by taking upon himself human flesh. That's called the incarnation. Jesus himself taken upon himself human flesh and being able to perform all the functions, all the duties, being able to keep all the obligations, perfectly ho holding fast to God's law. And in doing so, he was able to satisfy God's demand. Only Jesus has been able to do that because the Bible makes it very clear all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's only one person who ever existed who could actually look at a crowd, even his own mom, even his own uh, brothers and sisters, and say, which of you can convict me of sin? The only person who was ever able in the entire history of humanity to be able to point to himself as the standard and ask the question, which of you can convict me of sin, was Jesus himself. 
Because Jesus never did anything that didn't please his father. That's why his father would speak from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is capable of bringing us to his father because Jesus met all the standards that God established. So if I try and go before God based on works of righteousness which I have done, well, the Bible makes it very clear there's none righteous, no, not one. God's standard is perfection, and even if I only sinned one time, I've missed the mark. And that's what sin means. The, the, one of the Greek words that is translated sin is a, a word that is, is simply missing the mark. You miss the mark of perfection. There was a target. You had a bow. You have an arrow. You, you level on the target. You fire. You don't hit the bullseye. We cannot hit the bullseye 100% of the time. We know that. Every honest human being will admit that. We're not perfect. So it has nothing to do with whether I'm better than another sinner. The question is, am I better than Jesus? And the answer is no. So if I'm not better than Jesus and God's standard of righteousness has been established in him, what's the wisest thing I can do? The wisest thing I can do is embrace him because he said he came to seek and save those who are lost. Now I happen to be lost and Jesus Christ came to find me and he found me. And in doing so, he takes me to the Father, and, and I am now given his righteousness. The Bible speaks concerning an imputation. I receive something that is not mine. I receive it by faith. I receive what is his, and he gives it to me. He imputes to me righteousness because I'm unrighteous. And when God gives to me Jesus' righteousness, now I'm clothed in the righteousness of God. Therefore, I can stand before him as one who has been completely forgiven. And when that happens, because I receive by faith Jesus Christ, I can enter into the kingdom of God. I can enter in as his son because I have received him. And to the ones who have received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God, even unto those who believe on his name, is what John said in chapter 1, verse 12. And that's how it works. And so we, by faith, have asked Christ to come into our life because we needed salvation. Because ultimately what happens is you reap what you have sown. Now, if I through my lifetime am reaping to the flesh, from the flesh I do reap corruption. There's no way that I can stand before God without the help of God himself. I'm on one side. God's on another. There's a chasm separating us. It's much too far for me to jump from one side to the other. It's impossible for me to do that. So what God did is he provided a bridge. He gave us Jesus who with one hand reaches and takes my hand and with the other hand reaches and takes his father's and connects us through him. That's how it works. And so when we have Ezekiel here speaking, he's saying, Jerusalem, you're a city of blood. You're a city that sacrifices your own children. You'll go and offer your baby to Molech. You'll slaughter your own child. You'll drop that baby on the arms of that heated brass idol and you'll allow that baby to scream its way into eternity. You have those mu musicians playing that music and the women who are chanting loudly to drown out the screams of your own infants. And then you have the nerve to come to the temple and offer sacrifices to me. And you think that I'm going to accept them. You're a city of blood. I have sent prophets rising up early, speaking the word to you, but you refuse to hear. And now it's too late. Babylon is coming. Babylon will wipe you out. There will be an 18-month siege. And ultimately, the temple will be destroyed. The walls will be broken down. And everybody that remains will be taken captive. Powerful words. And the reason is, because you haven't turned to me. Now, as this is all taking place, verse 15, also, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from you the desire of your eyes with one stroke, yet you shall neither mourn nor weep nor shall your tears run down. Sigh in silence. Make no mourning for the dead. Bind your turban on your head. Put your sandals on your feet. Do not cover your lips. Do not eat man's bread of sorrow. 
So I spoke to the people in the morning, and in the evening my wife died. And the next morning I did as I was commanded. I spoke to the people in the morning and in the evening. The desire of my eyes died. My wife died. I did as I was commanded. This particular sign is heartbreaking. I find it beautiful, actually, to be honest with you, in verse 16, how God speaks of his wife, because that's who he's speaking of. He says, I take away from you the desire of your eyes with one stroke. That's what he's saying when he's saying your wife is going to die. The love of your life, Ezekiel, is going to die. And Ezekiel, I do not permit you to mourn. I want you to think about that for a minute. It isn't, it isn't one of those marriages where my wife died. Oh, well. It isn't one of those kinds of relationships. God made it very clear right here. This was the love of your life. This is the desire of your eyes. And I'm taking her from you quickly. This is your deepest love, the deepest love that you have on earth. This is the one that you love with warmth and tenderness. I'm going to take away from you your wife, Ezekiel. Undoubtedly, Ezekiel's wife was a godly woman. She has to be to put up with a prophet. She was a godly woman. She was more than likely extremely sweet. She was loving. She was patient. She was understanding. She was a minister's wife. And God is going to take away from Ezekiel suddenly his beloved wife. Now, as I was thinking about this, and I want to develop this for just a moment, as I was thinking about this just today as I was preparing this portion of the study, I began to think of how I take for granted that, that everybody, everybody, I take for granted that everybody who's married or everybody who can, can you know, would contemplate it at least, that everybody would say that, that their husband or their wife is the desire of their eyes. I take that for granted. And, and sometimes when I, when I speak to, to even my own church, I, I'm, I'm making huge assumptions every time that everybody here is on the same page, that everybody here understands exactly what is going on, that, that every married couple here would immediately respond uh, as I would respond if God said, now, David, prepare yourself because tonight Marie's coming home. How would I respond to something like that? Sudden, shocking, unexpected. She's going to what? I make an assumption that everybody loves their husband or their wife like that. But I forget that not everybody does. I forget that not everybody has a commitment to that person that they're married to. In the case of Ezekiel, just the thought of him losing this one who was that important, well, that, that, that would have caused incredible and deep pain for him. It would be deep because this was a woman that he was married to. And and he saw marriage as a sacred institution. He saw marriage as something that was divine. And, and the reason he did is because he knew that marriage is more than simply a living arrangement. He knew that, that his marriage to, to his wife, this woman who is the desire of his eyes, was a holy and sacred establishment, an institution that had been, been created by God himself. He knew that and therefore he valued it on that basis, you know, that's where the difference is. Those of us who believe that marriage is a sacred institution value it. We value it. 
for what it is. It's a sacred institution established by God. It is not a humanly ordained and established institution. We as believers understand that God is the one who put it together. In the Old Testament book of Malachi, in chapter 2, verse 14, Malachi 2, 14 refers to marriage as a covenant. It's a sacred agreement. It's a contract that has been made before God himself. Now, obviously, America as a nation has slowly seen the value of marriage erode. For many, marriage has less value. And because for many, marriage really has less value or no value, for them reading this and seeing this taking place, that, wait a minute, you're saying that God took this man's wife from him? No, they wouldn't understand how he would have felt. They wouldn't understand the spiritual element of it because they don't see it as a spiritual thing. Because marriage for many isn't really sacred at all. You know, I, like you, I watch the news and I read the newspapers and all. I almost hesitate to use this as an illustration, but I will. Because it's common knowledge. It's something that we're all aware of. It's something that you read the paper, you read about it, you turn on the news on your, as you're driving, you hear about it, you turn on the news at home at all. If you watch the news, it's reported on the news. It's common knowledge and has been for a few days now. And that, uh, what I'm re relating to is, is the confession of David Letterman. Obviously, I, I don't watch him. He gets on my nerve, I have to tell you that. I mean, the very last nerve, he gets on it. But we all know that he confessed to have had various encounters while living with a woman. And as he made his confession, which uh, perhaps you, you heard as he was making his confession, I found it, to be honest with you, I, I found it sad that the audience actually was cheering. They applauded as he was speaking of the various encounters that he's had, they cheered. But, but what is interesting to me, and this is the reason I'm bringing this up, is the anger many seem to be experiencing is not at David Letterman for doing what David Letterman did. Have you noticed that? They're, they're, they're not mad at David Letterman. They're mad at the man who they think is extorting him. That's where the anger is being poured at poured out right now. It's being poured out at this man, the man who's supposedly behind everything. And they're not angry that David Letterman did what he allegedly did and has confessed to have done. They're not even saying it's wrong that he did that. According to MSNBC.com, rumors of his affairs circulated for a long time, and those in the know defended their boss. Now, this is the same group that's constantly defending women's rights. But I guess that women's rights really don't matter when you're defending a comedian. I wonder what would have happened if it was Rush Limbaugh who was caught in this. Do you think that everybody would be rushing to his defense? Or the Rome Polanski thing 32 years ago or so, he raped a 13-year-old? And he's got Whoopi Goldberg saying, well, it wasn't really rape, rape. This is the society that we live in. That's why it's hard for people to understand what marriage is. It's because it's not sacred to them at all. It's interesting. It was pointed out that by offering a confession in a monologue, the audience took it as being part of his show. Their laughter made it entertainment, and his discomfort made him a victim. And it was turned around. And if you watched it, that's what took place. The Washington Times said that this confession was an adept PR move, public relations move. And it seems that it's more about public relations than contrition and repentance. And I have to agree. I think it was a sad thing. It's a wrong thing. But there are numbers of people who don't understand what makes it wrong. 
for many, they don't have a relationship with a woman or a husband that has the depth that Ezekiel would have had. Because when marriage is a sacred covenant entered in with faith, love matures over time and actually deepens. You see, what's taking place, I think, is there's a distinction that's being made, which I find really interesting. The way the world has a methodology of changing things, and there's a distinction being made between fornication and adultery. Letterman married after 23 years of dating. He has a child with his now wife, but it would seem to indicate the way that they're responding is that adultery was worse than the years of fornication. And what that does is it takes the edge off of sin by making one sin more acceptable than another. Fact is, fornication and adultery are both sins. But people get more weird over the adultery than they do over the fornication because fornication is rampant. Because even Christians don't think there's anything wrong hopping in bed with somebody that they feel sexually turned on by. And they have such an odd sense of what they think grace is that they've extended it to become a permission to continue in sin so that grace may abound. And Paul said, what? Shall we continue to sin so grace may abound? Paul said, God forbid. How can I who died to sin live any longer therein? His whole point was, don't you understand, and he was speaking to the Romans when he said this, that grace has been extended to us not so that we can continue sinning and go to heaven, Grace has been given to us so that we can be free from the bondage that sin brings in our lives. And rather than continuing in it and excusing it and then arguing grace, grace, saying, oh, it's all grace, and therefore God understands, he said, don't take advantage of the grace of God. But that's what we're doing. We've gotten into this nitpicking, so the people are actually saying, well, adul adultery is worse than fornication, when before God, adultery and fornication are usually in the same sentence. And they're both sins. They're both sins. In this particular case here, there are many who would not be able to understand the depth of grief and what would be going on in the life of a man like Ezekiel because they wouldn't understand the depth of righteousness this man has. They wouldn't understand because Ezekiel had a godly woman that he loved, that God said, she's everything to you. This woman is the light of your life. This woman is the light of your eyes. This woman is everything. She's the desire of your eyes, and I'm going to take her from you in one stroke. She is going to be gone. It's going to be sudden. And the suddenness would make the grief even deeper. We all know that. Any in this room who've had a friend, loved one, who had a prolonged illness, when they finally died, you can almost feel a sense of relief that they finally have released and they're now with the Lord. You can find a relief in that because you had your time to say your goodbyes. You had your time to minister to them. You had your time to, to mend any, any broken fences. You had time to, to do your reconciliation. You were able to do those things, and, and then they, they died, and then you say they're in peace and they're with the Lord. But a sudden death, something you're not expecting, something that happens quickly, you don't have any time to respond to that. And that's what the Lord is saying is going to take place. Your de her death is going to be sudden with one stroke. But you're not to mourn. You're not to mourn in any form. There will be no weeping. There will be no tears. There will be no customary activity of grief. Your pain, Ezekiel, is to be kept silent. No mourning is going to be allowed. You're to go on living as if she had not died. You are to subordinate your normal emotional responses. He went home after God spoke to him. He spent time with his wife with the knowledge she's going to die. And that night she did. And God said, sigh in silence. There will be no ritual mourning. You're not to remove your turban. Normally, they would remove the turban that they might put dust and ashes on them as a symbol of mourning. They would remove their shoes. He says, keep your shoes on. 
they would veil their upper lip. He says, do not veil your lip. And not to have a customary mourner's meal, none of these things will apply. And so he says in verse 18, so I spoke to the people in the morning, and at evening my wife died. And the next morning I did as I was commanded. Now, how could he do that? Now, this, I, I have to tell you, I stayed on this for a while today. How did you do that? He did that because there's something greater. He did that because he knew there was something for her that was greater than what she was experiencing here on earth. He knew that his wife would be safer with the Lord. He knew that his wife would be set free from Babylonian captivity. He knew that she would be free and that she would be with God, that God would take care of her because she would be with him. He did this because he believed in God. He did this because he trusted in God. He did it because he believed in God's promises. When you look at the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, verses 8 through 10, it says there, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance, and he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city that has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. How did you do that? How did you dwell in tents? How did you live in such a way? I did that because I knew I'm just passing through. I did that because I knew that, that, that earth is not my home, that heaven is my home. There's a country better than this that I'm going to. There's a city greater than this that I'm going to. I'm going to be with the Lord. In Hebrews 11, 24 through 26, it says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. He looked to the reward. He said, I could rule as a Pharaoh. I'm in line to take that throne. I can die, perish, or I can, I can be with my people and I can have the reproach that takes place now and continue in glory for eternity. What's my choice? My choice is to continue with God in eternity and glory. As I've said to you before, there are many people who believe that the only requirement to enter into heaven is to simply die. But that's not how it works. It's by faith. It's by faith in God. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. It's by faith in what God has done for us. It's not an automatic. Not everybody goes. These are men that you, you can use as an example. The entire 11th chapter of Hebrews is filled with examples of people of faith and the things that they did and how that God rewarded their faith because it's by faith that we're saved and it's through faith that we receive. And so what happens is when you have an idea of eternity, when you believe in heaven... Then when you see a loved one who loved the Lord, when they die, you know that they are with the Lord. When my father went home to be with the Lord, Marie and I went and spoke to a, a man I was making a living trust because I didn't have anything. I didn't have anything set up, and I thought, well, I better take care of some business that I've been putting off for some time. So we went to a lawyer and we set up a living trust and we were being interviewed by the person who was putting it together. And he asked me, why are you beginning to do this now? And I said to him, I said, well, my father recently went home to be with the Lord. And he looked at me and he said, what an interesting way to put it. And I said, what do you mean? He said, how you just said that? He said, went home to be with the Lord. I said, that's where my dad went. I said, my dad went home to be with Jesus. That's where believers go. We go home to be with the Lord. That's how it works. You know, some people talk about heaven as the great out there. Heaven is our home. Heaven has been prepared for us by Jesus. And he said, I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Heaven is my home. It's what Jesus is preparing for me right now. That's where I'm going to go. And that's where my dad went. And so 
you know, I didn't lose my dad. You don't lose your loved one. If they know the Lord, you know exactly where they're, they're at. They're with the Lord. You know exactly where they're at. And that's the place that you're going to go. So Ezekiel is able to say, my wife has passed to the other side, but I will be with her too. And so with that strong knowledge, he says, the next morning I did as I was commanded because she's safe. What better arms could she be in than the arms of the Lord? What an extraordinary example of obedience under painful circumstances. Because obedience to God is based on emotions, some think this is harsh, but Ezekiel faithfully performed what God commanded him contrary to his natural inclinations because he had a hope of something beyond this earth. Well, as this has taken place, the people, verse 19, said to me, Will you not tell us what these things signify to us, that you behave so? I answered them. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Speak to the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will profane my sanctuary, your arrogant boast, the desire of your eyes, the delight of your soul. Your sons and daughters whom you left behind shall fall by the sword. You shall do as I have done. You shall not cover your lips nor eat man's bread of sorrow. Your turbans shall be on your heads, your sandals on your feet. You shall neither mourn nor weep, but you shall pine away in your iniquities and mourn with one another. Thus Ezekiel is assigned to you according to all that he has done. You shall do. And when this comes, you shall know that I am the Lord God. I've done what I am commanded to do. I've provoked a response in you. God wanted them to look within. God wanted them to obey what he was saying. That's why in verse 19 they asked him, why are you acting the way that you're doing? Why are you not mourning for your wife? So he answers. And basically what he's saying is, though Babylon is destroying the temple, it's really God who's profaning it because God is the one who's destroying his temple through Babylon. And even as Ezekiel said, I lost the desire of my eyes, you're going to lose the temple. Now, in their own wickedness, they'd already profaned the temple. God is simply putting a stop to it. You're going to lose the temple. There are going to be many killed. Your children will be taken to Babylon. It's going to be overwhelming. And you're not even going to be able to respond as you normally would to such a disaster. Verse 25, And you, son of man, will it not be in the day when I take from them their stronghold, their joy, their glory, the desire of their eyes, and that on which they set their minds, their sons and their daughters, that on that day, one who escapes will come to you and let you hear it with your own ears. On that day, your mouth will be open to him who has escaped. You shall speak and no longer be mute. Thus you shall be assigned to them, and they shall know that I am the Lord. There's going to be a captive who's going to come and he's going to report to you all that has occurred. And then he says, up until that time, you're to remain silent. Now that takes place if you take notes in chapter 33, verse 21. What this is going to do is vindicate the message that God gave. But until then, he's going to be silent concerning Jerusalem. Judgment came. Judgment came. Nebuchadnezzar started the siege on that very day. Judgment came. But I want to thank God for God's mercy because judgment came on Jerusalem that day. But God has extended to us his mercy because when we received Christ as our Lord and our Savior, Judgment is not going to fall on us. We actually, because we have a relationship with God through him, are not entering into judgment. We're not going to pass into condemnation. We're passed from condemnation into life. As the one who has received Christ is not to be condemned, the one who received Christ as Lord and Savior has been washed by his blood and forgiven of his sins, her sins, Judgment won't fall on us. Jesus took that judgment upon himself. But the nation of Israel didn't turn to God, and the nation received judgment. So, in the 21st century, 
I can turn to God and I won't receive judgment. I can refuse to and I can be judged. It's a choice that I make. That's why I've chosen life. That's why I chose to get right with God through Jesus Christ. I encourage you to do the same.